endoscopique ou endoscopie flexible et chirurgicale. Et vous allez voir que c'est un chapitre particulièrement important qui est devant nous et que comme pour les autres, ce qu'on a entendu au début d'après-midi, les chirurgiens doivent s'engager, faute de quoi, ils resteront sur le quai. Donc je passe la parole à M. Sopa qui va modérer cette séance. Merci et bonjour à tous. On est encore en train de régler quelques problèmes techniques, notamment en raison des vidéos. Je voulais surtout euh, remercier euh, nos orateurs qui euh, ont fait le déplacement parfois euh, de très loin. Remercie aussi euh, Jacques Maresco euh, qui a bien voulu permettre euh, à Alice Winslow et à Rouirou Inoué euh, de venir nous rejoindre aujourd'hui. Euh, également euh, euh, la société Olympus qui, euh, qui euh, on va dire, soutient de façon logistique notre réunion. Et puis également euh, Pascal qui s'est donné beaucoup de mal, pour, comme d'habitude d'ailleurs, pour euh, euh, vous maintenir ici jusqu'à une heure relativement tardive. Alors, un mot sur effectivement cette session d'endoscopie flexible chirurgicale ou de chirurgie purement endoscopique. Votre, ça n'aura pas échappé à votre sagacité que Guillaume Portier vous présentera quelque chose qui n'est pas réellement flexible, puisqu'il s'agit de la technique TEM. Mais en France, la chirurgie faite par endoscopie flexible est quand même quelque chose d'assez rare encore. Et nous allons voir avec Lee Swanslum un un plaidoyer en faveur de l'apprentissage de l'endoscopie par les chirurgiens, qui est peut-être encore un peu trop, franchement, même trop limité. Et puis, euh, vous verrez avec Arouiro et Noué, euh, le, les, les, la myotomie de LR euh, faite exclusivement en endoscopie flexible, ce qui représente quand même euh, probablement le summum euh, du mini-invasif. Et aussi avec Jacques Devière, qui a une très grosse expérience des pratiques de, chir de, on va dire de chirurgie bariatrique presque, euh, en tout cas de procédures euh, visant à, à, à traiter l'obésité morbide par voie purement endoscopique. Et c'est quand même cette voie, effectivement, la façon dont on peut imaginer le mini-invasif euh, euh, selon, selon le terme consacré, puisque particulièrement dans l'obésité, on est susceptible de se jouer euh, des problèmes techniques qui sont liés à, euh, au poids très important. Alors, je ne sais pas si sur le plan technique... Euh, voilà, on est prêt, donc euh, je vais donner la parole tout de suite à Lee Swanslum que euh, la plupart d'entre vous connaissent, puisqu'il est effectivement membre de l'Académie. Voilà. C'est bon. Bon, merci beaucoup et, et je vous remercie pour l'opportunité à, à parler euh, devant vous. Euh, c'est où le... Ouais. Sorry. C'est avec fierté que je suis un membre étranger ici, mais malheureusement, mon fran ma français c'est très pauvre, so excusez-moi, et je, je pense que c'est mieux si je parle en anglais. Prochaine fois. So I'm going to discuss a little bit about a project I'm involved in, uh, in Strasbourg, and I think many of you are familiar with the EHU. Uh, part of the Investissement d'Avenir. It's okay. Uh, Investissement d'Avenir. The, the program in Strasbourg is based on image-guided surgery. As you can see from the main statement of that, uh, we seek to try to fuse um, both minim all minimally invasive approaches, whether it's laparoscopic surgery, flexible endoscopy or interventional radiology for a new type of surgery, new type of surgical intervention. Of course, the IASHU framework calls for translational research, uh, quality health care, so a clinical aspect, and education is very important to us. Uh, as you can see, 
part of our goal is to train and create a new type of surgeon, one that uses all the tools available, whether it's a flexible endoscope, laparoscope, or interventional radiology. So I'm gonna talk, of course, a little bit uh, more, mostly about uh, our fusion of flexible endoscopy and surgery and what we're doing for that, because we think it's very, very important. So we call these hybrid interventions, whether it's a com combination of laparoscopic surgery and interventional uh, endoscopy and or, and or interventional radiology. I think this certainly goes along with the evolutionary forces in surgery. We all know that it was a revolution to convert from open surgery to laparoscopic surgery, and it was the force of the public's desire to have less invasive surgery that pushed that forward. That hasn't gone away. So even though laparoscopic surgery is being practiced today, that same desire of patients is still there. And this quote from John Hunter in 1762, I think, says everything. Surgery gaining much from the general advancement of knowledge will be rendered both knifeless and bloodless. This has been a dream for all time to have a truly non-invasive surgical procedure. <coughs> So surgeons sometimes wonder why the number and type of surgeries that we do is gradually decreasing. This is a big concern in the United States uh, because there's fewer and fewer surgeons and fewer and fewer surgeries to be done as well. As you can see, both the number and the types. Unfortunately, our residents in the United States graduate with sufficient experience with, for only 10 procedures after their six years of training. Uh, and it's considered by the experts that uh, it's considered by the experts that there's 121 essential procedures that need to be learned by our residents. So where are all these surgeries going to? Well, at the same time, the number of surgeries is going down and the types of number of the types of procedures, interventional radiology and flexible endoscopy, the number and types of procedures is increasing. <coughs> so this is the competition for surgery practiced by other specialties for the most part. And uh, we're gonna talk today about flexible endoscopy and, and I'm going to try to argue to you that in France, we need to introduce young surgeons into the practice of flexible endoscopy because that's where the cases are. So flexible endoscopy today is not the old flexible endoscopy where it was diagnostic. Professor Devier is going to talk about bariatric surgery. Uh, Haru Inoue is going to talk about achalasia surgery. And we just happen to use the tool of a flexible endoscope to do these surgeries. You see here even even the American Gastrointestinal Medical Societies talk about endoscopic surgery. So we're talking about true surgery. It's just done with a flexible endoscope instead of a rigid one. You can use your own examples. Uh, when we first started uh, doing procedures, we did a variety of procedures that are simply no longer done. No more ulcer surgery is treated endoscopically. No more common bile ducts. You do ERCP, colon, giant colon polyps, bleeding, perforations, all early cancers. All these things are treated endoscopically. No longer treated surgically for the most part. And in fact, all the new developments of surgery, all the latest uh, developments um, that are out there, whether it's notes or endoluminal therapies, uh, or either radiologically directed or fl use flexible endoscopy. So not only are the cases disappearing, but all the research and all the efforts to develop new types of surgery are going in the direction of interventional radiology. When is the last time you heard of somebody trying to design a new open surgery or an, even a new laparoscopic surgery? It's not there. The research is towards these less invasive fields. So how is this handled by the surgical community? Well, there are some countries where surgeons are natural endoscopists. In the UK, Canada, several countries, 
the majority of endoscopy <coughs> is done by surgeons. It's an essential part of their training and they do it. In the United States, it's mandatory that surgery residents be trained in flexible endoscopy. Now most of them, 50% when they go into practice, don't do it anymore, but every surgery resident is required to learn flexible endoscopy in the United States. Same in Germany, Austria, Italy, although it's very spotty whether the surgeons do it in those countries. France is a little bit special. It's almost illegal for surgeons to do flexible endoscopy in France. Can't tell you how much trouble I got into the first time I picked up a flexible endoscope uh, in Strasbourg and I thought there was going to be a riot. Um, so, so it's a very atypical, most countries aren't like this and I think it's time that we think about changing it. So it's time for a revolution, if you will. I, I think we have a good argument for this because flexible endoscopy is a real surgical field. It always has been. Um, this is a nice paper that was written a couple years ago uh, discussing the role of surgeons in the <coughs> development of flexible endoscopy. That's a, f a surgeon uh, right there. That's, um, um, do you remember who that is, Haru? I'm <laughs> forgetting, forgetting his name. Um, uh, anyway, uh, surgeon, famous sur uh, Sh Chevalier Jackson, uh, one of the founders of flexible endoscopy. But all these developments in flexible endoscopy that sometimes you don't realize, whether it's polypectomy, ERCP, peg tubes, all these were actually first done by surgeons. Poem, we have the first person to do poem here in the room, transgastric cholecystectomy, etc. So surgeons are very intimately involved in the whole origin and development of flexible endoscopy and its progress. And in fact, there's several famous surgeon endoscopists. Uh, I'm also du dual boarded in, in uh, endoscopy and surgery, and you can see Haru Inoue and Guido Costamagna, famous surgeons who also do have a very uh, robust practice in flexible endoscopy. I would make the argument that you can even say that today in 2013, a flexible endoscope is an essential tool for digestive surgery. It's, I, it's almost inconceivable that you can be a busy bariatric surgeon or a foregut surgeon or even a uh, colon, colorectal surgeon and not have that tool at your immediate disposal. And as I mentioned, all the current developments that are going on, both in the equipment and also in the new procedures, are around flexible endoscopy as well. Uh, whether it's early cancer treatments, treatment of perforations, complications. Uh, Jacques Devier is going to talk about bariatric surgery. A very hot topic is full thickness resections, endoluminal with a flexible scope. Uh, and even notes is still a hot topic, and there's just plenty of centers uh, uh, working on notes right now. So, of course, it's all driven by the availability of instruments. And I think surgeons are often surprised at the breadth of instrumentation that's available for the flexible endoscope. You can see almost everything that's available as a, as a, um, a laparoscopic tool is available as a flexible endoscopic tool, whether it's suturing, um, bipolar coap coaptation, coagulation, monopolar devices, specimen retrieval sacs, endo loops, all that is available for flexible endoscopy. So flexible endoscopy has the full range of surgical tools. It's become very essential in many fields. Uh, this is the experience with esophagectomy in our center. And we no longer do esophagectomies essentially for Barrett's esophagus. Uh, so all this is treated with tissue ablation, uh, Barrett's procedure. So you can see the number of esophagectomies for benign disease has plummeted while cancer has gone up and up. And in, in Asia, uh, this procedure, ESD, endoscopic submucosal dissection for early cancers, combined with screening endoscopy, has radically changed the course of the disease. And in fact, this is one of the few successes in cancer that we've seen. Certainly surgeons can't claim to have made a big progress in pancreatic cancer, or esophageal cancer, or gastric cancer. But with a combination of endoscopy, both screening and early resection, in Japan, actually, the number of cancers 
has plummeted. So they've actually made a, a great impact in society. And I think many of you are aware, if, if you're a digestive surgeon, uh, that uh, leaks are very well treated uh, endoscopically. And in fact, every year we get more aggressive at treating leaks. This actually shows a perforated esophagus and I'm putting the flexible endoscope into the mediastinum to wash out the mediastinum in the left chest. Um, and here, here's the hole in the esophagus. Then we'll suture the hole in the esophagus closed and put a stent across it and uh, uh, percutaneous drain in the left chest and the patient does very well with that. There's advanced clips that make it even easier. Um, these are giant clips that go over the tip of the endoscope as you can see, can give a robust, full thickness closure uh, to perforations or even intentional resection sites. And that hallmark of surgery, which is suturing, the thing we most are, are most proud of and that we think is, is the signature of <laughs> surgery, is doable endoscopically. There's a number of suturing devices now available endoscopically uh, from a variety of companies and they work in different ways, uh, but with the flexible endoscope, it's now possible to suture. This is one of the most uh, commonly used ones. This is the, the Apollo overstitch device. This is a suturing machine. This is a suturing machine that fits on the tip of a flexible endoscope and can do full thickness bites, running sutures, and uh, interrupted sutures, whatever you want. This is something that we use every day in both our operating room and our endoscopy suites. And the flexible endoscope of the future is not going to look like a traditional endoscope. These are a couple, these are two prototype. The, the Anubiscope is actually available. The other from uh, Olympus uh, is, is still in research phase, uh, but as you can see, these look more like laparoscopic instrumentation than they look like endoscopic instrumentation. So with these devices, it's possible to uh, do bimanual manipulations, uh, to use uh, monopolar cautery, and to do complex uh, procedures using this flexible format. You'll see ergonomically, it's much uh, the same as a traditional um, traditional laparoscopic uh, position. And even that work, working um, device that surgeons use every single day if you're a digestive surgeon, staplers, are now coming oh. out in flexible format. Right now the smallest one's five millimeters, but there's a three millimeter prototype flexible stapler that will go down through the channel of a flexible endoscope. So once we have staplers, I think it's easy to imagine that you're going to do a lot endoluminally. And Haru's going to talk about uh, this procedure, the POEM procedure. Uh, this has now replaced laparoscopic surgery in many centers. And uh, at our place, we no longer do laparoscopic heteromyotomies for achalasia. We do this procedure. And uh, Professor Devier is going to talk to you about uh, bariatric uh, procedures. And with the amount of interest by industry, it's entirely possible that bariatric surgery, if you don't do flexible endoscopy, is going to gradually go away because some of these results are looking very promising. And there's a big, there's an ongoing number. If you read the GI journals, you see every month a new procedure. It's like surgery was in, in 1989 when there was a new laparoscopic procedure every month. Flexible endoscopy is like that. There's new procedures, new approaches, uh, and uh, that's going on. And in fact, I think surgeons need to pholy attention because there's even mention of cholecystectomy done with a flexible endoscope. And this is not notes. This is not transgastric or transvaginal cholecystectomy. This is transduodenal percutaneous uh, cholecystectomy. This is a startup company in the United States that's founded around that uh, premise that you can go in with a scope, puncture through the duodenum into the uh, gallbladder, attach the gallbladder to the duodenum, 
temporarily make an incision, remove the stones, plug the cystic duct, and be done with it as a, a thing. And surgeons kind of think that's funny. They think that's un improbable. But if you think about it, with a flexible endoscope done as an outpatient procedure with no general anesthesia, taking 30 minutes, causing the patient no pain, and the patient goes back to work the next day, how is the laparoscopic surgeon supposed to compete with that? And what will general surgeons and visceral surgeons do if cholecystectomy goes away? So I think it's evident that the progress, the future of surgery needs to use the tools that are out there. We need to broaden our sights and look at the tools that are available and start using them. We know that vascular surgeons rose to that challenge and started doing interventional radiology. There's no reason general and digestive surgeons can't do the same thing and use the flexible endoscope. So that's one of my jobs in Strasbourg is how to implement this change for the French surgery education system. So this is my recommendation to people in Strasbourg and to you of what needs to be done to bring surgery uh, up to date in France. I think you need to obtain permission for French surgeons to use the endoscope. Has, has to be done. I think our trainees, our residents and interns need to have part of their training in flexible endoscopy or they're going to be dinosaurs by the time they finish. I think we need to engage the French surgical societies and the gastroenterology societies to train surgeons and to interest them in this. And I think we need to go out and educate surgeons in France of the benefits of doing flexible endoscopy, how important it is, and encourage them that they need to keep an open mind about this and learn it. In Strasbourg, as part of our curriculum at the EHU, we're starting a master's program in, uh, in uh, surgical endoscopy uh, with online didactics, hands-on labs, simulators. Uh, there's lots of great tools. FES exam is a validated flexible endoscopy exam. And so we're training our residents in Strasbourg now, starting this year, to do flexible endoscopy and they'll get a master's degree out of it. So it's our curriculum program, our first class of residents in the lab doing this. Uh, we have the help of numerous experts uh, uh, from around the world that help teach the residents, putting on courses, not only for residents, but also for practicing surgeons. So if anybody's inspired by my talk to come and learn how to do flexible endoscopy and bring it into your practice, I would invite you to come. And uh, for surgeons that ask me, how do I start to do this, I think the natural place is in the operating room. When you're doing a case, after you do an anastomosis, look at it with a flexible scope. When you're doing a bariatric procedure, check it out when you're doing it. If you do fundoplications, look at your fundoplication after you do it. Does it look right? Do you need to change it? Uh, there's a wealth of information, and surgeons certainly can use an endoscope in their own operating room. So as one of the directors of the EHU Strasbourg, I'd like to offer to the Academy uh, that we would be glad to host an annual national residence training course in basic or advanced uh, flexible endoscopy. So if those of you that teach residents, if you'd be interested in this, I'm offering open doors to you to send your residents uh, there. We'd be happy to put on a course for them. Thank you very much. Y a-t-il des questions pour Lee Swanström regardant, oh, pardon, uh, concernant cette, uh, cette proposition, oui, challenge, oui, réellement. Merci. Personnellement, je suis chirurgien digestif et j'ai franchi l'interdit au milieu de ma carrière qui est plutôt derrière moi. Ce jour-là, j'ai perdu les 3-4 correspondants gastroentérologues que j'avais et j'ai continué mon chemin nonobstant. Mais je voudrais dire que pour les jeunes chirurgiens, que je, moi je bois du petit lait dans votre topo, là, je, 
je suis aux anges quand je vous écoute, euh, vous préconisez que les jeunes s'y mettent, mais ils auront, quand ils commenceront leur procédure avec ces fibroscopes qui sont gros, qui sont, sont-ils plus gros qu'un qu coloscope, ou, ou ça doit être à peu près ce diamètre-là, le, le coloscope que vous montez en crabe, là. Il doit faire au moins 12, 12 ou 14 mm. Pour, passer, pour franchir euh, la bouche, euh, la bouche ésophagienne, avec un appareil comme ça, quand on n'a pas l'expérience des gastro qui ont fait des centaines et des milliers de, gastro, de gastroscopies. Moi, j'ai vu dans un congrès à la clinique de l'Alma, le plus grand gastroentérologue belge amuser la salle pendant 10 minutes parce qu'il n'arrivait pas à franchir, malgré qu'il soit aidé par son infirmière en chef euh, euh, la plus compétente et nous raconter euh, des choses pendant qu'il n'arrivait pas à franchir la, la bouche ésophagienne avec un fibroscope normal. Donc un jeune chirurgien de Strasbourg qui aura fait un petit peu de mannequin, c'est bien, mais il aura peu d'endoscopie interventionnelle chirurgicale. Et alors qu'il faut faire des centaines de fibroscopies normales, enfin sur, de dépistage, de coloscopie pour acquérir déjà une certaine sécurité. C'est des perforations de l'œsophage cervical, on en voit aussi. C'est sans doute pourquoi l'endoscopie, le, on va dire, de dépistage, l'endoscopie de base, doit devenir une partie intégrante du cursus de l'interne en chirurgie. Évidemment, on, on voit là des procédures très complexes. You show very complex procedures. We're not going to do this right at the end of residency, and then we, we have to start. I follow your, uh, oui, your proposition. Oui, vous avez raison, mais c'est simple pour, pour utiliser le endoscope standard dans l'opération. C'est simple, c'est pas compliqué. Et, et tous les autres, c'est vous avez raison, c'est très compliqué, c'est après beaucoup de, de formation, euh, euh, c'est dur. Euh, et euh, vraiment, c'est le, le, les procédures euh, de recherche. Juste un point d'histoire, je voudrais simplement rappeler qu'ici même, il y a près de 40 ans, Claude Ligori, qui certes était un gastroentérologue endoscopiste, avait montré combien il, est, il était possible d'extraire un calcul résiduel dans la voie biliaire principale après sphincterotomie par voie endoscopique. Et nous avions déjà eu, justement, et je, d'ailleurs, à cet égard, nous rendons hommage à notre maître Lucien Léger qui avait tout de suite perçu les perspectives offertes par ce merveilleux endoscopiste qui faisait d'ailleurs partie, à titre de membre libre, de notre académie. C'est une simple observation montrant que l'histoire nous apporte déjà des, euh, des exemples. Bon, merci. On va peut-être... Juste un petit mot concernant les travaillés avec Ligori pendant plusieurs années. Je pense que c'est important en tant que chirurgien. Et c'est lui qui m'a appris à utiliser un coloscope par la bouche pour les hémorragies digestives, car le canal opérateur est plus large et qui permet des meilleurs lavages. Je veux dire que quand on, a, on arrive à faire des fibroscopies gastriques avec un coloscope, on est déjà sur la voie encore de ce que vous avez montré tout à l'heure, de cette pince de crabe qui permet euh, cinq ou six instruments d'agir ensemble. Il existe manifestement des endoscopistes gastro-entérologues qui sont prêts à aider les